the assassins of Caesar thought that getting rid of him would allow them to restore the Republic to what it was before. But it was too late, and the assassination only quickened the process of its destruction, leading to new civil wars. In our previous episode, we have described how these assassins, who called themselves the Liberators, led by Brutus and Cassius, managed to build a huge army in the eastern regions of Rome. However, their Caesarian enemies, the Second Triumvirate of Octavian, Antony and Lepidus, built their own forces and were on their way to Greece for the final showdown. Indeed, the Battle of Philippi would decide the fate of Rome. But of course, when we say Rome here, we really mean its elites and top-level organization. For those toiling in the various corners of the empire, all this action was just a sideshow to their own tribulations. We can get more of this usually untold perspective on Roman history thanks to our sponsor Magellan TV and their documentary The Hidden History of Rome. Presented by Terry Jones, it's an enthusiastic look at the life of commoners in Rome, whose story was rather different to and disconnected from the dramas that made it into the history books and eventually these history YouTube videos. Definitely worth a watch, and if you'd rather see something else, then Magellan TV has the richest and most varied history content available anywhere, covering everything from the ancient to modern eras, wars, biographies, and the Earth itself. Furthermore, they also give you extensive collections of science, true crime, travel, and other documentaries. They add 15 or more hours of 4K high-definition content every week for their subscribers at no extra cost. It's all viewable anytime, anywhere, on televisions, laptops, mobile devices, and more. Get access to 3,500 hours of ad-free documentaries for only $4.99 a month, and get a month for free by subscribing to Magellan TV via our link in the description. The successors to the Caesarian and Pompeian party, the Triumvirs and Liberators respectively, both had amassed colossal armies. Many of the legions on both sides had served under Caesar, legions that Caesar had located in the east, likely including the 27th, 31st, 33rd, 36th and 37th, some of whom had been made of Pompeian forces after Pharsalus, and that had later fought with Caesar at Alexandria and at the Nile. The Triumvir's force, on the other hand, boasted some of Caesar's longest-serving legions, including the 6th, 7th, 8th, and Caesar's favorite, the 10th. Caesar's legions would thus once again determine the fate of the Roman Republic near a small town in the province of Macedonia called Philippi. In August 42 BC, Cassius and Brutus were the ones who held the upper hand. Their army, though smaller than the total force that the Triumvirs could muster, was roughly the same size as the one the Triumvirs had in Greece. Sextus's presence in Sicily ensured that part of the Caesarian fleet would always be pinned, giving Cassius and Brutus naval supremacy in the area. Moreover, the past decades of civil war had effectively drained Italy of much of its money and manpower. Cassius and Brutus, on the other hand, had plenty of both, thanks in part to their campaigns against the Lycians and Rhodians, and also because the East had suffered far less in the previous wars. Lastly, the presence of Mercus and Ahenobarbus in the Adriatic meant that the Triumvir's supply line was precarious, while Cassius and Brutus's was well secured. They were confident and prepared their forces for the campaign. The two began by securing the loyalties of their legions, paying them a large amount before even beginning the campaign, particularly to any legions that had served under Caesar. Cassius made an impassioned speech to the men, justifying their war. He defended the assassination of Caesar, saying that, We could no longer endure that one man should be a law in places of the laws, a sovereign in place of a sovereign people, an autocrat in place of the Senate's authority. Next, he targeted the Triumvirs, condemning their tyrannical actions in Rome, calling them leaders of evil men who proscribe their own brothers, uncles and guardians first. Finally, he addressed the men who had served under Caesar. Let it give no concern that he has been one of Caesar's soldiers. We were not his soldiers then, but our country's. The pay and the rewards given were not Caesar's, but the Republic's. 
For the same reason, you are not now the soldiers of Cassius or of Brutus, but of Rome. It was an excellent speech. With their legions' loyalties ensured, the liberators began their march into Greece. But first, they needed to pass the legions of Decidus in the Corpilian Pass, and Nobanus in the Serpeian. Cassius, in a brilliant strategic move, sent Tilius Kimber, one of the assassins of Caesar, with one legion to sail around their position, making sure he was seen doing so. Once he had landed, he made a huge show of making a number of camps. Norbanus, fearing that a large force had outflanked him, and that he was in danger of being attacked from two sides, requested Decidus to come to his position, so that they could more strongly hold one position. Decidus agreed, marching quickly to Norbanus. The liberators immediately moved through the now abandoned Corpilian Pass. Their feint had worked perfectly. The Serpeian Pass was now well defended though, and would be almost impenetrable. Fortunately, Rescupolis knew this land well, and told the Triumvirs of a route around the pass. It would take four days over difficult terrain, but with little other option, the liberators accepted the suggestion. Rascus, however, was also aware of this pass, spotted the maneuver, and warned Norbanus of the threat. Realizing that his position was now effectively useless, Norbanus withdrew his force in the night, marching to Amphipolis. So far, the liberators had been remarkably successful, bypassing two extremely strong defensive positions without any losses. Knowing that the main Triumvir force would be somewhere nearby, Cassius and Brutus prepared their force for battle near Philippi in eastern Macedonia sometime around September 42 BC. They encamped on two sets of hills, linking their two camps with a continuous wall, with an open plain in front of them, forest to their north, gorges and mountains to their rear in the east, and marsh in the south extending to the sea. To their southeast was the port town of Neapolis, which was acting as their supply base, it was an excellent defensive position. Antony, learning of their position and eager for the fight, merged his force with the eight legions of Nobanus and began marching to Philippi, leaving Octavian, who had been struck with illness in Epidamnus. He encamped on the plain, approximately 1.5 kilometers from the Liberator's position. It was an audacious move, his position not having much in terms of natural defenses. Nevertheless, he began the construction of his own fortifications, including palisades, towers, and embankments. For days, the two armies engaged in minor cavalry skirmishes, with little effect. Octavian, carried on a litter, arrived at the battle, assuming command of half the army. A close friend of Octavian's, Marcus Vespanius Agrippa, was likely also in this half of the army, though his precise role is unclear. Determined to force an engagement, Antony marched the army out of camp. Cassius and Brutus also drew their force out of camp, but reluctant to give up the high ground, they refused to engage. They had the better defensive position, and planned to wait until Antony's supplies ran out, starving him into submission. Knowing that he must force a battle soon, Antony sent a detachment of his men to discreetly construct a causeway through the marshes in order to provide a route behind Cassius's defenses. Cassius, upon seeing this, aimed to head off the causeway by extending his fortifications and building a palisade through the marshes. With a significant part of Cassius's force focused on this task, Antony seized the chance to attack on the 3rd of October. He mustered his legions and charged at Cassius's defenses, aiming at the point where the first wall met with this new palisade. It was an incredibly audacious attack, uphill and under missile fire. But with many of Cassius's men caught in the midst of constructing the palisade, Antony's men were able to break through the defenses, storming Cassius's camp as Cassius's men tried to rally an organized defense. At the same time, on the other wing, Brutus's half of the army charged across the plain to Octavian's force drawn up in front of their camp. Brutus had not given this order, and it is unclear whether the officers under his command had seized the initiative themselves, or if his men, 
frustrated at seeing their allies losing, had taken it upon themselves to act. Whatever the cause, Brutus's legions overpowered the 4th legion on Octavian's flank and turned on the rest, forcing them to retreat back into their own camp. As they did so, a general rout began, with many of Octavian's men being cut down and Brutus's legions streaming into the camp. Octavian's tent was found empty, and Octavian would later write that he had been warned in a dream of the attack and escaped. Pliny, far more believably, claimed that Octavian was carried into the marshes where he hid. Either way, Brutus's men had been hugely successful, looting the camp and claiming three legions' eagles in the process. However, Antony had been equally successful. He had repelled charges from the men working on the palisade in the marshes and completely overrun Cassius's camp, forcing Cassius to retreat to high ground. His men also looted the camp before retreating back to their position. Brutus and Antony's legions crossed the plain at the same time, but due to the distance between them and the huge amount of dust thrown up by the forces, each assumed the other were their allies and did not engage. It was only when the two forces made it to their respective camps that they realized the truth. The first Battle of Philippi had ended with both sides having won and lost in different areas of the battlefield. According to Appian, the Liberators had lost around 8,000 men, the Triumvirs 16,000. Cassius, on the high ground, and seeing his camp overran, assumed the battle was lost. A group of Brutus's cavalry rode to his position to give him the news of their success. However, Cassius instead assumed that they were enemies who were coming to capture him. Not willing to risk being taken prisoner, Cassius ordered his freedman Pindarus to kill him. With his death, the Liberator's army lost one of its most experienced commanders, and total control of the army passed to Brutus. The same day, news reached Antony that a fleet under the command of Domitius Calvinus that was transporting two legions and supplies across the Adriatic had been destroyed by the Liberator fleet in the area. Antony's supplies would be running out soon, and he needed to force Brutus into a decisive battle. He marched his army out of camp, hoping to tempt Brutus out from his defenses, but Brutus held firm. With his force now weakened from the previous battle, however, Brutus tried to consolidate his position by making his defensive perimeter shorter. In doing so, he abandoned a small hill to the south that Cassius had previously garrisoned. Antony immediately seized upon this small advantage, sending four legions to take and defend the hill. Over the next few weeks, more and more legions were funneled in this direction, constructing a line of defenses parallel to the coast. In a similar style to one of Caesar's favorite tactics, he had seized upon this small advantage and was using it to slowly make his way into a position where he could threaten Brutus's supply line. In response, Brutus made his own fortifications opposite Antony's line. In doing so, he effectively negated his previous strategy of consolidating his position, finding his defensive line being stretched further and further. Brutus's officers, wary of their supply line and being overstretched, became more and more frustrated with him, losing faith in his command ability. They demanded that he take action and give battle, a demand to which Brutus reluctantly gave in, saying, You have chosen to fight, you have forced me to battle when I would conquer otherwise. He drew his army out of their fortifications and prepared for battle in the classic Roman formation of triple lines placing himself on the right wing. He also placed more legions on his right wing than in his center and left, stretching the legions on the left to prevent them being surrounded. He was effectively hoping to mimic his legion's success in the previous battle by crushing one flank and then turning on the rest. Antony and Octavian eagerly also drew out their own forces in a triple axis, with Antony on the left and Octavian on the right, their legions evenly distributed throughout. There was little maneuvering or strategy to that battle, both sides crashing in to one another. With veterans on both sides, the fighting was particularly brutal. Brutus was slowly winning the fight on his wing, gradually pushing Antony's back. 
At the same time though, Octavian's men, outnumbering their opponents, were also winning, forcing Brutus's left flank to retreat step by step. Whichever flank broke first would decide the battle. In the end, it was Brutus's left, overstretched and outnumbered, that collapsed first. The first line broke, and then the second, triggering a mass rout of the entire left wing. Octavian's men pressed their advantage, some storming the camp, others falling upon Brutus's center and other wing. Brutus's men, finding themselves almost surrounded, began to break around him. Brutus was able to cut his way out with four legions, retreating to nearby high ground, but the battle had been decisively lost. Seeing his death or capture at the hands of his enemies as certain, Brutus ordered his friend Strato to kill him. We do not know the number of casualties on either side, though the tough, infantry-dominant fighting may mean that they were high on both sides. What is known is that the entirety of the Liberator army that had survived the battle surrendered to Antony and Octavian, the legions being divided between the two. Alongside Brutus, many other influential Pompeians had also died in the battle. Marcus Cato, son of the famous rival to Caesar, died fighting heroically to buy time for Brutus to escape, and was reportedly found surrounded by many dead enemies. Antony had also made it a priority of his cavalry to chase the routing enemy, capturing or killing whichever officers and other influential men they could. Kimber, one of the assassins of Caesar, was likely one of these men killed. Philippi marked the end of the Liberators. Out of the main ringleaders of the conspiracy against Caesar, all were gone. Decimus Brutus had been killed by Gallic chieftains on Antony's orders, Trebonius had been executed by Dolabella, and Cassius and Brutus were now both also dead. Cassius had been buried somewhere near Thassos in secret by Brutus, who had been worried that a public funeral would dishearten the men. As for Brutus, Suetonius claims that Antony beheaded his body, planning to display the grisly trophy in front of a statue to Caesar, but that it was lost in a storm crossing the Adriatic. Suetonius is somewhat known for his exaggeration and tall tales, however, and other sources say that Antony treated the body with respect, covering the body in purple, burning it in the Roman custom, and sending the ashes back to Brutus's wife. While much later sources tend to vilify Cassius and Brutus, the Roman sources were often rather torn by the two. On the one hand, they had betrayed and murdered Julius Caesar, a man who was already deified and would be further lauded during the empire as the ancestor of the first emperors. On the other, the two were viewed as brave, virtuous men who had genuinely believed that they had done what was necessary to defend their country. Though Cassius was the assassin who arguably had the most personal reasons for hating Caesar, he had also been a man of principles and was eulogized by Brutus as the last of the Romans. He had fought alongside Pompey, had refused to fight against Pompeians where he had later been taken into service under Caesar, and genuinely considered Caesar a threat to the Republic. The most active member of the conspiracy, it is probable that the assassination of Caesar may well have never happened without him, for better or worse. Appian, in his account, points out how extraordinary it was that the two could win over even ex-soldiers of Caesar and motivate them to fight against both Caesar's right-hand man and his son. This should suggest to us that Brutus and Cassius had not been alone in thinking that they truly had the Republic's best interest at heart. At the same time, Appian cannot excuse the assassination and views Brutus and Cassius as tragic figures, divinely punished by the gods for their sacrilege in attacking Caesar. The resistance against the Triumvirs would continue without Brutus and Cassius, but in Appian's words, none would hold the same glory as attended Brutus and Cassius. The Liberators had been destroyed at Philippi, but the Pompeian cause overall still persisted. Sons of some of the original leaders, such as Sextus Pompey and Quintus Labienus, son of the prolific Labienus who had served under Caesar, still resisted the Triumvirs. More importantly, 
the destruction of the Liberators put Antony, Octavian and Lepidus as the undisputed masters of the Roman world. The three men, who had previously been allied out of common cause, would soon find themselves in conflict with one another. Rome's civil wars would continue. And if you don't want to miss any episodes, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.